I'm going to try not to do that. It's a real pr privilege, privilege for me to be here today. Um, and I, I am charged with talking about survey of transit photometry techniques and results. And this really turned into an opportunity for me to not only show you some neat results that have happened over the last, well, since 2000, really, about transiting extrasolar planets, but to also give you a little bit of story and background for what happened with the Kepler mission and other missions along the years I've been involved with. Um, currently, I am at the University de Montréal. Uh, Montreal in uh, Quebec, Canada. I've been there since September now. And then starting in July next year, I'll be moving to Bishop's University uh, with a new faculty position. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time for you right now, and this is really cool stuff. So um, we always see when you look at the NASA long-term reviews that there's, some dis there's lots of discussion now coming with exoplanets. North of the border, we're hearing that as well. And we have what's known as the Canadian Astronomy Long Range Plan. Uh, which is now being recently rehashed and reinvented again. And there is exoplanets that are now part of the astronomy long range plan. And put the screen back. Uh, specifically because we have things like TMT, which are funded, which is a really big thing for Canada. And of course, our involvement with JWST coming forward. And that's part of the reason I'm here. As part of the uh, JWST NRES group at University of Montreal, uh, I get funding through the Canadian Space Agency. So I want to make sure while I'm here to tell you about all the great things JWST is going to do. I think you'll hear some of that for the hands-on sessions. And in particular, tell you about this instrument, the NRES spe splitless, splitless Spectrometer. Don't worry, I'm not going to take up the entire talk on this. I just want to make it apparent to you. And this is actually a picture of the instrument before it's been integrated into the rest of the bus with the rest of the instruments. But the main goal from that one is to try to observe something that you might call Earth 2.0 or something like that. But it's these potential Hubble zone planets to look for what actually might be something that's an Earth-like spectrum, oxygen, water, to pull all those nice things out of the atmosphere. But of course, the realm that we're entering now is it's not trying to detect effects from planets that are 2%. It's detecting effects that are five parts per million, one part per million. And uh, when I started my PhD, it was certainly, I was trying to measure things to 100 parts per million, and we've gone another order of magnitude beyond that. So it's, it's really, really incredible how things have changed. And the other thing is quite apparent is that exoplanets has evolved very, very rapidly, and that we've gone from a field focused on discoveries of everyone trying to put their hand up and saying, I'm first, I'm first this, I'm first that, and that's nice and all. But now we're getting into the real fun part, as I'm, I'm concerned, which is now we're trying to actually characterize these planets, right? Mass, radius, bulk density, albedo, brightness, temperature, atmospheric composition, and all this so far currently is being driven by transiting extrasolar planets. This will probably change to direct imaging as we get better AO instruments and better star shades in the future. But the current state of affairs is that transiting extrasolar planets and why we're all here is what's currently driving the exoplanet field. So let's see if this plays. If I click it. Nope. Well, we'll see if it plays or not. Uh, so what I was going to show you here is an overview of the mass radius relationship of all the planets that we've observed so far. And I don't think it's going to play. So, is this a PDF or keynote or? Doesn't matter. Uh, oh, it is keynote. OK, well, whatever. That's fine. It was just going to show a nice little animation that says that we have all these planets that we're observing so far with masses and radii, and then showing you different techniques that have been coming up from finding them. So we'll probably get more into this as we see with radio velocity surveys and TTVs of that we find diversity in planets. And that's a good keyword to have moving forward, and that no one single planet seems to be unique. Everyone, ha every planet has its own special characterization, has its own uh, a special composition. Everyone is different in its own ways. And that's a little bit surprising. I know when I started with Kepler, we also sort of expected that we were going to find a few thousand planets. They were going to have this range. They're going to have this distribution, follow some power law or something, and life will be easy. But of course, it didn't turn that way out at all. It, it, life is much more complex than that. Come on, there we go. And so to sort of go back in time and wind up a little bit, is I'd like to actually string all the way back to about 1980s, 1988, 
Uh, this is a picture of Gordon Walker. He was on my PhD committee. And he's the guy who figured out to use gas cells in front of rate of velocity instruments so we could do the precise rate of velocities that we're used to seeing today. Uh, and there's a big story behind this. And if you're out with me at dinner or you see me in the streets, just ask me. And I can tell you the full backstory of why the first extrasolar planet didn't start with Gordon Walker back in 1988 and how it happened later. And part of the reason is because my PhD supervisor showed up at the University of British Columbia and convinced him to be ultra cautious about what he was publishing, which is probably a good thing in the long run. But it also meant that we had to wait a number of years later before we had a good rate of for the first rate of velocity detection. So fast forwarding, because we're going to get an overview of, of RV planets for, uh, uh, soon. I like to just jump right into transiting extrasolar planets, which really starts around 2000 with, uh, with, with Dave Charbonneau's plot here from his paper on from observations in 1999 of HD 209458, right? So this is a Jupiter-sized planet that goes around its host star every three and a bit days. And this is the 2% light curve of the discovery of it. Um, during this part of my career, I just showed up at UBC and I was a young student and I was watching all these profs bicker with each other and that half of them saying extrasolar planets are real and the other half saying they're just brown dwarfs. And at the AAS meeting where this was announced, this really put the nail in the coffin where it was quite certain that we were seeing transiting extrasolar planets because we already had the rate of velocity measurements from it and now we had the transit that went with it. So there was no doubt about it. That this, and so you, we had a bulk density, right? And it agreed with what the expectations were for models for hot Jupiters at the time. So this was a, a, a day and night, at least for me, with how I observed it at the time, of watching the community change their opinion for what it meant to be a, a, a detection of an extrasolar planet. And then slightly afterwards of what came of one of the best transit light curves, maybe still even last to today, is this HST observation led by Tim Brown in 2001 of HD 209.458. And people, a lot of people have cut their teeth and driven great careers by working on this spectacular data set that came from STIS observations. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful archive to work with. I know I've learned a lot from reading people's papers on it and just looking at the light curve itself. And there's beautiful HST observations of HD 189.733 as well. Um, uh, and we're going to hear much more about HST coming forward as well. Of course, there's also the Spitzer Space Telescope, which has driven the, driven the field a lot. It gave us the first phase curve observation of a planet, HD 189733, the first observation of light coming from an extrasolar planet uh, by looking at the, sec the secondary, uh, uh, by looking at the occultation measurements of watching the planet disappear behind the star, and also how to deal with really nasty data issues, right? I'm sure a lot of you have probably dealt with dealing with interpixel variations. And in fact, I think these approaches can still be used to actually utilize more out of things like Kepler data sets. There's the MOST mission launched in 2003, June 30th. It was actually July 1st in Canada when it launched, which was Canada Day. And this was the instrument I worked on for my PhD. It's a 15 centimeter telescope that's about this big. Uh, that was uh, launched on a former intercontinental ballistic missile, and we put it to good use. Uh, we used it to observe HD 209.458 as well. Uh, we were able to show it had low reflectivity. It was used to find the transit of 55 Cancri E, right? It's this beautiful instrument. I know Deborah talked about it earlier that she's also used it to do simultaneous observations with radial velocities and do correlations. And it's just a nice little instrument to have. This is my first uh, introduction to lots of data from space-based observations. This is four different seasons of observing HD 209458 with most, 2004, 2005, 2007, 2009. You can see that the data quality is changing because we're learning how to deal with the instrument over time and that the length of the data sets is changing. And on top of that, you can also probably tell that the star itself is changing, right? Stars are not constant. They're especially not constant on four-year timescales. Right? And it's with these essentially 600,000 data points that broke every computer I had access at the time that I tried to do that albedo measurement with. There's a Corot mission launched in 2006, uh, which is uh, unfortunately had hardware problems, is no longer active, but 27 meter broadband optical telescope. It had a uh, one channel dedicated to astroseismology, another channel for exoplanet studies, has numbers of numerous important discoveries, Corot 2b, which is a planet around an extremely active star. Right? If you want to learn to deal with transits and active stars, check out that one. Corot 9b, 
the first moderate temperature giant. It's a giant planet with a period around 90 days. Corot 7b, one of the first rocky super Earths, right? This is a very much a clone to Kepler 10b. And anybody that deals with radial velocities is this is a, a, a data set, then how do I figure out stellar activity versus pulling out these small signals for planets? So read the literature, especially when the discoveries were made, because I think there's three papers that give three different masses, all with different errors, right? And I, people like Artie Hatzi sat down and tried to figure out good observational strategies to show how to pull that data, pull the real signal out of the data and deal with stellar activity. And interesting, I think with last week, an announcement came out that, and you can pull it off the slide, that you can actually go and get all the Corot data that's been reprocessed and re-released for about 160,000 stars. These, these light curves about have 100 days, 180 day duration. So pretty cool stuff. And it's all there. And I'm sure there are more exoplanets in there that have yet to be discovered. And of course, the one I'm going to concentrate the most on today and sort of walk from my insider trader information is to tell you about the Kepler mission that really blew open the, blew open the doors on transiting extrasolar planets. Kepler 9b, first system where we found very convincing transit timing variations. We got the measurements wrong the first time of how we analyzed it. We got it right the second time. Kepler 10b, Kepler's first rocky planet, came out almost about the same time as Corot 7b. Kepler 11 is this very compact system, the prototypical example of a six-planet system. Kepler 16b, the Tatooine system, a circumbinary planet, the one that has Star Wars for its cover image. Right. Kepler 20b, the first planet smaller than the Earth that we found with Kepler. I actually tried to give this a special KOI number, but I failed at doing it because I wasn't paying attention at the time. Uh, Kepler 37b, the one with the tagline of that's no moon, it's a planet. Kepler 78b, the hell planet that goes around this planet every 20 days or so, something like that. Kepler 138b, uh, first time we measured the mass and radius for a star, for a planet that's less massive and smaller than the Earth. And the statistical analysis behind this is incredible. I know Eric Ford and, uh, and Daniel, uh, John Tuff Hunter are instrumental at making this measurement a reality. Kepler 62f, the first planet we found that was about 1.4 radii in Havel zone. And then Kepler 2. Well, 296F, the first, well, that's the KOI number, um, first planet that we found that's Earth sized in the Hubble zone. So the list goes on and on. It's not stopping anytime soon. Um, so I've actually worked on all three missions. And one of the things I got to observe was that as one mission was operating, most was first, and another one was coming online, as the teams behind the scenes, you might think they're all fighting and trying to be claiming to be the first person to do this and that, but it actually wasn't the case. There was a lot of data sharing that happened because everyone was trying to train the people coming after them not to make the same mistakes. Um, specifically, the most team provided Corot early access to our images. This is what an image from most looks like. You get three little postage stamps around three random stars. You get this donut looking thing, which is actually a Fabry image to defocus the star. And we provided these images Corot so they could test their onboard photometry routines before they launched. When I worked with Kepler, Corot provided us early access to their photometry so we could st study stellar variability as a function of spectral type to see how was that going to affect us when we did our transit search. Before that, the only data we had was the sun. Right? And now we had Corot, and Corot was very friendly, and it built a lot of long-term collaborations by able to doing this type of work. And we'll hear more about this later. I'm sure Courtney's going to go into lots of details of transit surveys. But now we have K2, which is driven mostly through geo proposals. I hope you're all aware that there's geo proposal for the next K2, maybe even the last one that's coming up. So get your proposals ready. We have all the ground-based surveys with WASP, HATNET, TRACE, AMEARTH, and TRAPPIST. And this incredible TRAPPIST-1 system, three Earth-sized planets around an M8 dwarf. It's incredible, right? And this might be the first, this might be one of the best systems for JVOST. Maybe. Maybe it's a GJ1214B, that's arguable, but, uh, you know, it's the ground based surveys which are heavily contributing now towards picking up where now we've lost Kepler for its, well, Kepler doing faint stars, but now ground based surveys being able to pick up for the brighter stars. And then the other thing, what has Kepler taught us about planets and transiting planets is diversity. Uh, I don't know when this plot came from. It doesn't matter because if I show you the most recent Kepler one, it's just more dots, right? But it's showing you we find planets that go from orbits of hours to orbits of years, from things that are sizes that are smaller than Mars to planets that are the same size as stars, right? We cover all that variety. And there's beautiful statistics you can do with these data sets. 
And of course, you get the big press releases like Kepler 186F. And I gave the KOI number earlier. Uh, this was a fun thing to do because it shows up in the front pages of newspapers and online things. So this is the screen grab I did from the Globe and Mail, which is a national Canadian newspaper. You can tell it's Canada because we got caribou on the cover. That's important news. Right? <laughs> But it was also important to realize that you know, the, the public loves this stuff. right? So that's why we got to think about what we're doing and the picture that we're giving to the public. We're not finding rocky Earth-like planets. We're finding potentially rocky, potentially Earth-like planets. And we should make sure that we're getting these facts across to the public and to ourselves as we work through this field. OK, so transit, that was essentially the results. Now I'm going to jump into transit photometry techniques and the history lesson of ever dealing everything that you probably don't want to know about the Kepler mission, but I have the stage, so I'm going to tell you about it because I never really get a chance to do this. So, uh, the brief summary: Kepler's started off with 42 CCDs, 100 square degree field of view. Put your hand up in front of you. That's the size of the Kepler field of view, right? And it's studied in total probably over 200,000 stars in the end. And I'm going to talk, essentially assert the topics I want to run through are. Go, how, how do we do this? How do we go from pixel to planet? How do we search for planets? How do we catalog the planets? How do we characterize the planets? And if you want to pick apart all my awful coding, I put all the stuff I've used for Kepler up on GitHub, um, which covers all the topics necessary, and you're free to laugh at my coding style. And I haven't done the 15-year cycle yet of going to a new coding language, so you'll see what it is. Um, the first thing I always tell every audience that if you have a chance to go watch a rocket launch, go. It's the most incredible thing you'll ever see in your life. I was lucky enough to go watch Kepler launch back in 2007, and, or 2009, sorry, from, uh, from Cape Canaveral. And this is actually a picture I took from there. And it's not going up and crashing in the ground. It's going up and disappearing behind the horizon. That's the booster rockets falling down back afterwards. That's, I think this one here is Tau Botus. So that has a planet around it. So. Like I said, go. Skip Disneyland. That's boring. Go watch a rocket. Okay. Um, it, now here comes the story lesson. Has anyone ever tried plotting something like KOI number versus something that's measured? Right? It's not a random number. Right? And there's reasons for that. So in this case, what I've done is I've plotted KOI number versus Kepler magnitude. And it's not a scatter plot. There's, it's, well, it turns into a scatter plot, but there are things that happen in there. Well, let me back up a second, mixing up the slides here too. But you can see that there's these ramps and distributions and things that happen from it. And that's because the, whoever the person was that did this uh, sat there with this huge fire hose of data coming at them and decided that they needed to put some order to it for how they did it. And there was a little bit of reasoning for why they did it. First of all, in the early months of Kepler, there was a big push that we had to have our first results. We had to have something that we knew was a planet and would be 100% concrete. So how do we do that if I have a transiting planet? You go get radial velocities, and you show the exact same, the same period, and you have the mass and radius. So no one's confused about it. So that meant that when the data showed up, we did two things. We actually printed all 100,000 plus light curves and put them into binders and giant books. And people sat there flipping through the light curves and identifying planets. And the more reasonable people for us did it on our computer screens. But we identified a bunch of them by eye, and particularly around stars that were bright so you could observe them with things like Keck and get quick rate of velocity measurements from them. And that turned into Kepler 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? Those were the first discoveries we had to do very quickly. And then after that, because there was a still huge demand from all the people that had written their proposals to have lots of telescope time, is that we sort of just kept doing it that way. And that we started with the brightest stars and worked our way down into the fainter stars of flipping through essentially lots of plots and identifying what we thought were good transits and assigning KOI numbers to them. Right? And that's sort of how this pattern developed. So here was the quarter zero, quarter one shows up, quarter two shows up, so now you start the whole thing again. And as more data dumps came down, sometimes it didn't even make it faint enough, we just stopped and it started again and came back up again because a new data set showed up. And we weren't able to keep up with the flow of, at least I wasn't able to keep up with the data flow of everything that was flowing into my, in, onto my essentially little tiny laptop. And there's actually a little break from it that comes here. Suddenly there's this big 
big weird thing that happens here. We purposely went off extremely bright stars to make sure we weren't missing some obvious ones. We actually found one. And we purposely went and hand looked at every single M dwarf because we had the expectation that M dwarfs were going to be these crazy, insane things to deal with. But it turned out that BLS and things like that worked just fine with them. But we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing something silly with the M dwarfs. So we searched all few hundred of them at the time. I think Lucien Watkowit had a, a couple of fun weeks visiting us at Ames and never came back again. No, that's not true. She actually did come back. But, but you know, it's, it's all there. Um, so this is what the plots looked like when we started with it. It was a top panel. This showed a light curve. There's a dip in it. And then we fit some transit model on top of it. And we had really boring meetings every Tuesday from 10 to noon where we sat down and flipped through all these discoveries and decided by essentially committee of whether or not we thought it was good to follow up for rate of velocities. Uh, these were, to give credit, all these started with Ron Gilland. He showed his initial version, uh, got everything started, and then I sort of copied it and developed my own version of it. Uh, and then it turned into this kind of version, uh, which added more information to it. But for a long time, it was you would run a BLS or you would run some sort of wavelet search, and you would find these looking transits and you would just plot them. So here's the, phase, here's the phased and bin light curve, and you can see a transit. Here's the odd versus even. There's no, nothing silly going on, so we think it's a planet. There's the full light curve. There's the dip. This is the data binned on top of it. This is the raw data with triangles marking where they are. There's a bunch of statistics that are plotted around. But really what it boiled down to was, did it look good to your eye, and was the single to noise greater than this magical number of seven? And that was it. And if it was, we called it a KOI, we called it a planet candidate, and we moved on. And we did this for ages, right? OK, so here's one. Well, if I remember how to read these diagrams, the single noise is 23.3. Here, here is the phased light, full, full phase light curve. There's the dip. Here's the event centered and binned on that event. There's the odd versus even. There's the full light curve. Who, th who would label that as a planet? No. I did, all right? It's not. <laughs> this is a false alarm. But to your eye, it's very convincing. Right? You can do some very simple tests of just shuffling the data and injecting this and searching it again, and you'll find all sorts of correlations in the data that produce singles that look like this. Right? So our simple method of phasing at one specific period and trying to pull it out really threw us for a lot of loops at the time. You know, we, we learned as we went along. I had just finished my PhD. Uh, so my statistics were slowly learning. I had just written my first Markov chain Monte Carlo routine at the time. So you know this was a big learning experience for me at the time as well. And it sort of just happened. So let's look at transit depth versus KOI number. You know, there's correlations there too. There's all the stuff that happens at the beginning. Because we were doing brightness, you sort of have some sensitivity issues. And you can see this is the quarter six catalog. And what we started doing was starting with the deepest events, what's the most obvious ones, and cataloging those, and working into the muck. And the way it worked was we kept working until we got diminishing returns. It wasn't a full systematic search. And that's why every time you start again, quarter six, quarter eight, and then a partial search, and then quarter 12, is that there was always this ramp that started because we were picking up all the ones we didn't find from the time before of doing these systematic searches of going through and validating them all by hand. And then you can, <clears throat> you can see in quarter 16 it changes. It's just more scattered. We, saw, we got our act together finally and started doing more automated ways of populating the KOI catalog. And then the latest one uh, for Jeff Coughlin and the DR24 for quarter, quarter 17 had two big changes. One that included all the really deep things, so all these eclipsing binaries that are up here, as well as having more automated searches for everything down there as below. And that's why you can see this behavior is changing. And luckily for the QR25 is that we will have this type of diagnostics for everything. So maybe we can finally do a proper statistical job of understanding the KOI catalog. Right. Uh, so transit detection reliability, or false alarms. I went into Google, and I was looking for something on transit injection. And this is the image it showed me. So it's a, it's a false alarm. It's a Ford Transit fuel pump injector, or whatever you want. <laughs> uh, so that's Google images for you. But um, false alarms are a real pain, right? And Jesse Christensen sitting here in the front is probably the king now of dealing with false alarms. And she's been doing transit injection. And if you're going to be doing uh, data searches on tests or data searches with Kepler, I think you should corner her and 
suck all the information out of her mind, leave a little bit so it'll regrow back, but uh, take it all over her mind and learn how to do transit injection properly. And this is really teaching us of how we deal with false alarms and reliability for our Kepler transit detections. And another simple thing you can do is what I call transit inversion. Just take the light curve centered on zero, zero, flip it so all the transits go in the opposite direction, and now do your search again, right? Other than some weird lensing things and maybe some weird periodic flare things, there should be no transits in your data. So this is your perfect null test, right? Go test your, test, go test your finding algorithms and see how many transits you find when you flip it upside down, right? Simple things to do. And of course, then there's false positives. And this is one thing I would like to make clear. False alarms and false positives are two different beasts. They have the same label. If you go into the Nexi list and you say candidate versus false alarm, you, candidate versus false positive, you can't make that clear distinction yet. Um, I think this is lacking. I'd really like to work hard to put this classification into work. And I think with the tools that are coming out for the next Kepler data release, that you will be able to distinguish between false alarm and false positive. And that's important because there is a limited number of false positives that are in the Kepler data set. There are infinitely number of false alarms, right? You make your threshold lower, you get more false alarms. All right, so that's how we did the KOI catalog and how hopefully it's better and hopefully we'll take all those lessons learned and everyone can now apply that to tests when it comes out and maybe we can do it right this time. Planet characterization. To do planet characterization, you need a list of ingredients and you mix them all together and hopefully get the right character, well, at least the radius of the planet and the period, I guess, the two main ones you pull out. But you need your light curve model. Mandelagel is very popular because it's analytic, so it's computationally fast. There's how you deal with the light curve itself. That's a detrending, typically how it's done. So you precondition the data and then you run your transit search. Um, I'm liking this Gaussian process regression stuff that I've been learning a lot about now as well for trying to do this and simultaneously trying to fit everything possible. I think you should too. Uh, stellar parameters are their own beast. You don't understand the planet unless you understand the star. If you're going to be an exoplanet, prepare to become a stellar evolution and properties expert as well. It's well worth the effort. And then my favorite hateful topic of all is limb darkening. Transit timing variations, which were Personally, I think a lot of the fun lies. These are beautiful astrophysics laboratories. And then in the end, a lot of work I've done is pulling out posterior distributions on all of the Kepler discoveries that we've had. So number one is detrending. Well, how do we do it? The simplest way is we just simply apply a running polynomial cubic filter through the data. Right? So at every single data point, I stop, take a width, say two days or something like that, fit a polynomial to it, remove that trend, move to the next data point, and move forward. If I do that, that's obviously going to distort a transit so to characterize them, we just say, well, I know the transit here, it has its duration, so I'm going to mask out all the data around it and then use the polynomial to extrapolate over that, to interpolate, which is never the best thing. Um, I honestly think it's, this is the way forward. It's computationally difficult because you're dealing with 60,000, 100,000 data points. That if you can do something like Gaussian process regression or even do the simultaneous fit with your polynomial filter and your transit model together, I think you're going to do a much better job and understand how, how, well how well correlated it is that your, your detrending process and your transit model really is. Because what is this thing I'm applying here? It's a bandpass filter of some sort. I'm arbitrarily removing noise on specific time scales away from the data and hoping that that's independent from the transit. And for a lot of cases, that's probably a good approximation. And for a lot of cases, it's obviously not true. So I was going to go and give you the quick five minute version of Gaussian processes. My, my talk is taking, it's, it's ticking away. So I will quickly just tell you to go see these resources. Uh, one, everyone talks about Dan Formamaki's uh, page on this. I did it. It's well worth the time going through his slide deck and even his Python code to dig it out. And then at least the first couple chapters in the appendix of the Gaussian process for machine learning really sets the mathematical framework for understanding both how to computationally do this and try to understand the, the, the likelihoods behind it. Uh, the key thing you wanted, at least I learned, is how do you invert a matrix? You get your likelihood. It's this thing here, your kernel, which you have to invert, which if you have independent errors, it's one over sigma square as a diagonal. That inversion is easy. When you have correlations, it's difficult. So you have these fancy terms. And it boils down to, oops, sorry, that you can use something called Cholsky decomposition, which is when I first learned about this, of how to quickly decompos do decomposition on a matrix so you can do quick inversion. And 
You have things like LAPAC, well-tested routines that have been around since, well, since before I thought about astronomy, uh, that you can use to solve all this stuff for you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. But it means that if you want to do a Gaussian process thing, you can pull things out like these simple intrinsic routines, oops, sorry, like this guy here and that one there, and they work in Python, they work in any code that you can think of, C, Fortran, uh, I don't know, well, prob probably, well, just about everything. And then you can quickly do these, mat these matrix inversions and roll your own Gaussian process codes. And then likewise, you can find your own minimization routines and all that, but I'll just leave it on the slides and you can check it out later. But just to give you an idea how this works, right? So here is some nasty looking light curve. This is actually a K2 light curve of something that's moving. And every time it moves across a pixel, the photometry jumps. So I do a Gaussian kernel regression on that and essentially find a conditioned kernel, which is this green line, which is supposed to represent the vari this variability on a certain time scale. Of course, it has to be continuous, so it doesn't pick up these jumps that are in the data set. So I can now make my own model and model the variability of the source as a Gaussian process and then have my own model, which is the instrument model, and put the two together and reconstruct the light curve. Right? It's a very powerful technique, and it's worth trying it on things like this. Just be prepared that if you have like 60,000 data points, it will break your laptop. So it will. OK, stellar parameters. This is another one with a big history lesson behind it of how stellar parameters evolved with Kepler. Uh, when we first started out, this was the Kepler input catalog, which was Lots of blood and tears from people like Tim Brown and Dave Latham. Um, if you mention kick around them, they may try to stab you. So approach them carefully about it. They did a lot of photometry and a lot of work to try to pull out temperatures, log Gs, and metallicities. Temperatures were OK right, from broad broadband photometry. Log G, hard, right, maybe 0.3 dec or something like that. F you over H, don't even try. This is a case where I've seen results on posters where people talk about correlations with metallicity from Kepler results based on the Kepler input catalog. And it's all bogus because FE over H is just a prior. So it's essentially a random distribution from what the, from what the it's, a, it's a random draw from the metallicity distribution assigned to a star. So really, unless you have spectroscopy, be careful with those metallicities. Well, want me to say that again? Yeah, it's a. Uh, Kepler is interesting when you're behind the scenes. They want everything, even if they don't understand what it means. So, yes, and there was a huge push from people like like Tim Brown and Dave Latham not to use it. Didn't mean, didn't mean people listened. So, so spectroscopy is the name of the game here. If you really want, that's the first step you really need to go to understand that. And then there's astro seismology with this beautiful result from scaling relationships of delta nu and nu max. If you don't know what delta nu and nu max are, look up some papers in astro seismology because this is a beautiful result. You measure the peak of where the oscillation pattern is and you measure the spacing the, uh, between the adjacent frequencies that you're measuring. Mix that with the metallicity and a measurement of temperature and you have the mean stellar density to very good precision, like better than 1%, which turns into model derived masses and radii, which are usually better than 1% as well. It's incredible stuff. And then usually there's some underlying stellar, stellar evolution model that drives this. When we started, it was Yale Yancey. The new flavor is Dartmouth. Baraf is always coming out with outstanding low mass models. These will change. Our understandings of M dwarfs change all the time because we do not understand them. We can't get their spectra right, let alone get their mass and radius right. So be aware. And then finally, we have our transit model. And typically, this is at least my parameterization, and I like it a lot. It's using mean stellar density, uh, time of transit, using the center of time of transit, the period impact parameter, the scaled radius. I missed the square root on this because David will give me crap otherwise because I do it as well. Square root of E sine omega, square root E cosine omega, and sometimes I measure the secondary eclipse. Uh, and the choice of using rho star is important because it allows you to actually do multiple transiting planets. In the past, it was using A over R star. But so you major axis divided by R is different for every single planet. But if you assume they all transit the same star, you save degrees of freedom. So it's a much, much uh, better choice. And then you can have fun. You can include all sorts of other fun effects like Doppler effects, epsiloidal variations, planetary phases. We've seen these ones, occultations, and even gravity darkening. If you want to look at a light curve that's a big mess, look at KOI 13. It shows all of this stuff. Right? So the, and of course, the mean stellar density. Um, 
uh, Sarah Seeger's paper from 2002, I think, walks through all the math behind this. Of, uh, oh, OK, five minutes. I better get moving. Of, uh, of uh, why we use the mean stellar density. And essentially, it's an approximation that the mass of the planet doesn't count according to the mass of the star. So when you have Jupiter-sized planets, you're incurring 10% errors on measuring mean stellar densities using transit methods. Right? And then limb darkening. Oh, I hate limb darkening. So this is the HST, this observations. You can see limb darkening changing from red all the way down from red color, from infrared colors. So it's, limb darkening is not so important to the blue. This is an Atlas model showing you limb darkening. So this is the angle from which you view the stellar surface versus intensity as a function of wavelength. So if you're going to do transit spectroscopy, limb darkening matters. Every wavelength has a different choice for limb darkening, right? Look how much that changes that if you ignore limb darkening or you assume it's constant according to wavelength, you're going to find all sorts of interesting features in your light curves or in, in your transit spectroscopy, which is not real. So pay attention to this, right? Uh, for instance, and then of course it's your limb darkening law, right? A popular choice is two parameters. The red line there, if you can see, it's kind of faint. It doesn't fit very well. It never fits very well, right? But we use it all the time because we can, it's, not, it's not degenerate with our fits. We can find ways of fitting this to transit light curves. A better choice is a nonlinear law with four parameters, but if you have some sort of bumpy transit, like a spot that goes through it, the limb darkening is going to try to model that spot as limb darkening from the star. So it's another degeneracy problem, and it's usually why we use two parameters. But I think this needs a lot of work of trying to actually do this. All right. Transit timing variations are another fun topic for me. This is Josh Carter's work on Kepler 36 from 2012. What we see here is the transit as it's measured for ever. So this is the transit depth, and you stack them and put them all on top of each other. So this is the center of transit as it changes over time, which is now called a river plot. And the colors are a great choice to call this a river plot. And these systems are wonderful for doing all ma mass and measurement radius, getting both the mass and the radius measurements of, of, transiting, of transiting exosolar planets. But you also have to handle it when we're doing transit models, because if you forget the TTVs, you blur out the light curve, and you get the transit model wrong. Uh, and then we have posterior distributions, which has been occupying me for the last number of years. Uh, initially, I used a bootstrap with uh, so essentially doing data replacement and then rerunning chi-squared or rerunning least-squared minimization every time. But it's the slowest thing in the world. So I switched to MCMC, which is much faster. And now we have this nice DMCMC routine that uses a lot of the fancy features that David Kipping was pointing out earlier. And uh, it's, a, it's a great little code. And we're quite happy to use it. And of course, we make all of our chains available for Nexi. We're in the process of doing it again for all the quarter one through 16, and we're doubling the amount of chains that are available and improving a lot on the previous iteration of this. So be aware of that. So what's next? Right? I don't think we're done with Kepler data. I don't think we're ever done with Kepler data, personally. Um, so what I'm doing right now, and i just give you a, a quick peek into this, is I've actually decided that I want to sit down and figure out why no one can measure proper motions with Kepler. Right? And I think I figured it out. So if you, so I wrote a little code that this measures all the that measures PSF like like the, like a DAO fot all star photometry. Wrote a simple version of that that works on a Kepler module. So I took all the postage stamps, assembled it into one one uh, fits image, and just fit a simple Gaussian model to all the stars and pulled out the centroid positions as well as doing aperture photometry at the same time. And what I found, so this is the frame index, which is more or less time, versus the flux in the red versus the centroids in the green. And every single time the flux goes in one direction, the centroids go in the same direction as well. And what you're seeing is intrapixel variations, which is what we saw with Corot. And it's there in Kepler as well. So we can actually now make a model to model both decorrelate the flux and get the centroids out. And we can actually now, I'm in the process of, of finalizing this, we can actually measure parallaxes for a few number of stars with Kepler that we couldn't do before. And <clears throat> we can probably do a much better job of detrending the data you all heard of PDC. I think if we include the centroid motions in there as a very good, as an important component, that we don't have to worry about which principal component do I multiply by plus or minus to try to match it to the light curve in some Bayesian fashion. Because this is the true principal component that we should be using. So to end off, I think I'm pretty close to running out of time. But again, because I work for JWST, I want to tell you about JWST and encourage you all to pay attention to it. There is the early release science coming up. Pay attention to the papers that are coming out of it. it. It wants community input. If you think 
that there's something wrong with the, the choices that are being made, you should voice that opinion. Right? You're all going to be community leaders here coming forward. And likewise, there's going to be your own, potential, your own ability to write GO proposals to say, what do I want to observe with JWST? And you'll probably learn more, see a lot of these coming up in the next day or so, but it's taking things like this, which is slitless spectronomy. So this is a couple orders for one particular star and trying to extract something that looks like a stellar, uh, the stellar spectrum involved with a blaze function. And then this is the difference between in transit, not a transit. Those little spikes are the problems. I'm not accounting for limb darkening. The green is what you should have gotten. Right? So there's lots to learn coming up and I'm not gonna dive too much into it. So to summarize, I hope we get the smell of scope because I want that. <laughs> but the field of transiting extra planets has drastically changed from our first discovery in 1999 to where we are with thousands of planets. And I'm looking forward to all of these great things and everything else that comes beyond it. And I'm hoping all of you be with me as we go along and do this together. Thank you very much. <clears throat>